Hello everyone, my name is Jalen. As you can see from the author list, Hyrax is a large project with collaborators across Microsoft Azure. We name our system Hyrax because of this cute, cuddly animal with a lifespan of around 10 years. And that's how long we want to run servers in our data centers. An interesting fact about Hyrax is, although it looks like a marmot or a capybara, it's surprisingly closely related to elephants. To discuss our project, we first consider how server business work. Okay, so this is a somewhat simplified view. A platform health monitor continuously checks server error log for any deviations from the expected configuration. If the health monitor suspects any kind of problem, the server is marked offline. VMs are live migrated away or gracefully evicted. The server is then rebooted into a diagnostics environment. The, di the diagnostics system is automated. If it finds a hardware problem, it immediately creates a repair ticket. A technicians resolve the ticket, usually by following the diagnosis. After that, the, the server is tested again to certify reliability. A reliable server is marked online and becomes a candidate for hosting VMs. In a case where servers do not pass the reliability test, it's moved to diagnostics again. We refer to this workflow all or nothing operation, or AON in short, because server either stays online in full capacity or offline due to any kind of fault. Unfortunately, this AON workflow is increasingly inefficient and costly. Okay, so we know from the literature and our own experience that repairs are slow. A server repair ticket takes days or even longer to resolve. At any given time in Azure, around 2% of the servers are always waiting for repairs. Another problem is, recent technology trend has made AON increasingly infeasible. For example, this liquid cooling requires opening up the tank or disconnecting the water pipe, which makes repair process even more complex. The third problem with AON is, cloud platforms keep, keep servers in their data centers for longer. Today, most server lifetimes are six years. So server repair, which is half of the blue part, account for 9% of the TCO. We want to extend the server lifetime to 10 years to amortize embodied carbon, which is CO2 generated during the manufacturing of server components. Then the server repair would account for 12% of the TCO, and that is a very significant cost. All of these reasons motivates us to our, to our goal. The main goal of this paper is to reduce server maintenance costs. More precisely, we want to reduce the hardware failures that requires technicians to resolve and eventually forego repairs if possible. To show you our key observations, here's a typical compute server configuration. If you look at the component counts in the figure, you notice that for many component types, the server contains multiple of them. For example, the server contains 24 DIMMs, six of each fans and SSDs, we look at the component counts in the server, uh, well, if one of these components fail, the server could continue to operate. But it takes some work, and uh, the server may have degraded performance. So we call these component types degradable. For the other component types, like motherboard or NIC, the server cannot afford to lose any of them. So we call them undegradable. So our main idea is to deactivate faulty components instead of replacing them and the server would operate in reduced capacity. Of course, this approach can only work if many failures are due to degradable components. So we study Azure's repair data for the most, for the, for the most common server generation. We break down the, the repair statistics by component types. And here's what we found. We observed that degradable components make up 68% of all failures. So that's a, that's a potential for a huge saving. In order to implement our, our idea, we need mechanisms to deactivate failed components and a lot of other things. With that in mind, let me show you the overview of Hyrax workflow. At a, um, at a very high level, Hyrax is a software stack that, that allows server with faulted components continue to operate without repairs. Hyrax is partially deployed at Azure for SSDs. The support for memory is gradually rolling out to production this year. 
we add a few states to the previously introduced workflow. After diagnostics, Hyrax policy decides whether to degrade a component or to repair it. If the component is undegradable, then it follows the original workflow. If the component is degradable, then we evoke the corresponding deactivation mechanism. And again, degraded servers need to go through the reliability tests. If the server is reliable, it comes back online, we mark the server as degraded to differentiate it from the healthy servers. There are multiple challenges to address when implementing this workflow. For example, during diagnostics, 6, how can we accurately identify faulty components? When does hierarchy policy choose to degrade and when to repair? How do we deactivate components? For this newly added online state, how do we integrate it to other control plane services? The cluster is no longer homogeneous, and that breaks the assumption for a lot of the control, the control plane services. How do we enforce the quality of service on degraded servers? And there's this big question, what if the clusters with degraded servers cannot host as many VMs as before? In this talk, I'll show you at a very high level how we deactivate components and enforce quality of service using DIMMs as an example. In the later part of the talk, I'll show you how we quantify the VM scheduling impact of Hyrax. Hyrax addresses all of these challenges in the paper. I suggest you to go ahead and check it out. An important observation when thinking about deactivation is, failures may occur at any point between core and the actual component. So we call this a component pathway. Our goal is to get high coverage, so we deactivate the entire pathway. In the case of memory, it could go from a DIMM to motherboard, to DDR memory bus, to memory controller, and eventually to a CPU core. So we rely on the automated diagnosis system to provide information on which DIMM is faulty, and then we use an, an uncommon firmware feature called rank enable bit, bit mask. This bias setting excludes all rank on that DIMM from the interleaving so that it will, they will not be visible uh, in, the, in the memory address space. Well, conceptually, it might seem pretty straightforward to deactivate a DIMM. An interesting observation is, how will this impact server performance? This graph shows the peak memory bandwidth for, uh, with two DIMMs deactivated in a naive implementation hypervisor would just randomly allocate VM memory among all three pages. Here, we measure the peak memory uh, bandwidth for different VM sizes multiple times to get this error bar. And then we perform the same experiments on healthy servers. We notice that in the worst case, this naive implementation can only achieve 20% of the performance of a healthy server when the VM has 32 cores. So, Deactivating DIMMs can severely impact the quality of service for large VMs. Let's look at the root cause of this problem and how we solve it. Suppose we have two memory, con memory controllers and three channels per memory controller. Each channel has two DIMMs. A single channel has a bandwidth of 20 gigabytes per second. To maximize bandwidth, memory controller interleaves cache lines across channels in a round-robin fashion. Interleaving across six channels would mean a bandwidth of 120 gigabytes for the entire address space. So what happens if one DIMM gets disabled? Something weird happens. So Intel memory controller requires the same capacity in both memory controllers. If DIMM C2 gets deactivated, F2 gets its only interleaving set. So we have uh, two regions. One interleaves across six channels, the other interleaves across four. But F2 is not deactivated, so F2 itself creates an address space of 20 gigabytes per second. So the problem is de uh, deactivating DIMMs partitions memory addresses into regions with different bandwidth. How do we fix that? Our solution is to, is to employ page coloring to assign the same color to pages with the same bandwidth. Then this page coloring is exposed to the VM scheduler uh, so that the VM time school's quality of service can be satisfied or scheduled. We implemented this solution, and Hyrax is presented as purple line in this figure. We see that 
Hyrax maintains less than 5% loss in the worst case when the VM has 32 cores. Now that we show you Hyrax ensures the performance on the server level, a natural question to ask here is, does Hyrax impact the VM scheduling on the cluster level? In particular, if a VM arrives at the cluster and, uh, and we can't fit it, it would have to be rescheduled to a different cluster. This is very undesirable because it uses up the capacity of the other cluster and it may delay the VM start time. So we use the percentage of VM for which there are insufficient capacity for out of all VMs assigned to this cluster uh, as our key metric. We call it rescheduled VMs. Why would Hyrax affect rescheduled VMs? On one hand, degraded servers have reduced capacity compared to healthy servers. On the other hand, degraded servers skips the repair process, and we know that the repair time contribute is, is a significant factor for server downtime. To evaluate the impact of Hyrax on rescheduled VMs, we use large-scale simulations based on real failure and VM traces from 66 clusters that span across two regions. We first look at the immediate repair, which is used in Azure today, where technicians immediately address the failures as they occur. Here are the results. On this graph, lower is better, as I indicated with the arrow. We observed that Hyrax scheduled the same set of VMs as in AON. We also look at an alternative scenario where technicians come to the cluster once per X months. Once they're there, they, they repair all the all the failures. We experimented with repair interval, intervals of three month, six month, and 12 month. Under AON, the number of rescheduled VMs becomes, um, uh, it's way too high for a repair interval of 12 months. In contrast, Hyrax manages to keep the rescheduled VMs low. Now that I've shown you Hyrax does not impact the VM scheduling, Let's go back to our, to our original motivation. That is reducing server repairs. We look at the percentage of failures that requires technicians to resolve, and we call this repaired hardware failures. And again, lower is better. We find that Hyrax saves more than 50% of the failures uh, under, uh, in the medium cluster under immediate repair. Under batch repair, Hyrax saves even more. And importantly, Hyrax saves all these repairs with minimal impact on hosting VMs, both in terms of performance and the scheduling capacity. In conclusion, from our simulation, Hyrax reduces the repair frequency by 55%. That translates to a TCO reduction of 4.5% if the server lifetime is six years. We also quantify some other benefits of Hyrax. For example, we find that Hyrax reduces the embodied carbon by 34%. How? It extends the server lifetime and greatly reduces the component replacement. For example, Hyrax reduces the DIMM replacement by 75% and SSD by 50%. You can see our hot carbon paper for more details. Our ultimate vision is to operate servers without any repairs. And that's, uh, and that's what we call a true failing place. But there are many challenges to address which inspire future research. For example, better support in the, in the operating system, new data center architecture that supports degraded servers, scheduling under heterogeneous cluster, and robust diagnostics. Hyrax is the first step toward, towards this direction, and we prove its viability and potential through our, through our experiments and simulations. Thank you. That's all I have.